Well, good morning, Chapel Street Church. I want to start with a question this morning. What did you want to be when you grew up? Maybe you're a student and you're still trying to figure that out. Maybe you're an adult and you're still trying to figure that out. What you want to be when you grow up? Well, when I was a kid and I was thinking about what I wanted to be, I went through all the typical kind of, this is what I want to be, policeman, fireman, astronaut, the most exciting and thrilling careers. Uh, but, and I had a lot of ambition and energy, but I very quickly discovered that all of these jobs required a lot of planning and a lot of effort from me, and I slowly went down the echelon of these careers until I ended up at Trashman. Uh, I actually told my mom one time, I want to be a garbage man because they don't have to do any paperwork and they don't have to deal with people most of the time. So that sounds like a pretty good career, but that was my jaded, lazy, younger self. One of the middle schoolers told me uh, a couple of weeks ago when I asked them this question that they wanted to be on the Supreme Court, so their ambition was a little higher than mine. Well done, middle schoolers. Uh, but we all have this question, right? It starts very, very early. There's probably no one alive who didn't have some kind of idea of, of what their plan for their life would look like, even from when they were younger. We think about what do we want to do with our lives, who do we want to marry, where do we want to live, and we build all of these plans around what might be. And it's just a natural part of life. It's common to all of us. And today's passage is looking at this question of how we plan, how we think about our futures, especially as Christians. And James has got some things to say. He's got some things to share about how we should plan how we should think about what it means as a Christian to think forward about what's coming. And as we've been reading this book, I hope that you have picked up throughout every single sermon, throughout this study of James, that the, the core of this book, at the center of what James is doing with these dispersed Christians, is he's trying to tell them about what faith looks like in their day-to-day -day lives. What it looks like if you believe what you believe about Jesus, if you affirm and you say, yes, I believe that he is the son of God, the one who died on the cross, the one who rose again to forgive me of my sins, what kind of an impact and a change should that have on the way that you live your life every single day? We've looked at things like how, how you speak. Are you thinking about the ways that you talk to others, the way that you control your tongue? Are you using your words to bring life and encouragement? We've looked at the way that we even treat one another in church. Do we show favoritism? Is there people amongst us that we are more inclined to show love and kindness to than others? More generosity to? And throughout, James has let this vein, this really convicting, difficult truth come through when he says that faith without works is dead. If you are hearers only and not doers, if you look at the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done, and that is not changing the way that you are living your life, then what James says is that you are deceiving yourself, that there is something missing. And this is not a condemnation. This is not an effort by James to make us feel bad. This is actually James loving us trying to show us grace, helping us to see that what Jesus wants for us is more than just an insurance card that we hold on to for one day in the future. And if that's true, then one of the things that matters most in our lives as Christians is how we plan. Because we're thinking about what happens from day to day. So if you guys want to read with me, we are in James 4 today, and we're looking at verses 13 through 17. This is what James says to us. He says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that vanishes for a little time, appears for a little time, and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him, it is sin. As we look at this this morning, I want to think about three questions that pop out. And the first one is this, what is your life? What is your life? If I asked everybody this morning to put your hand into your pocket and pull out your phone, I would guess that about 50% of people would pull out a phone that looks like this. The most famous smartphone in the world, the iPhone. 
And the iPhone, when it first came out, completely revolutionized the market of smartphones. And it's not, it wasn't the first smartphone, it's not even arguably the best smartphone, but it is the most popular, it's the most well recognized, and it was the uh, result of a man named Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs is one of the founders of the Apple company, the Apple Incorporated company. Um, that's a weird way to call it, we'll just call it Apple, because that's what most people call it. Uh, but he designed, in his mind, a lot of what we use now. A lot of the Apple computers, the smartphones, the iPod, all these things that completely changed the way that we thought about this branch of industry came from his planning. Because Steve Jobs was the man with the plan. What's interesting when you read about Steve Jobs is that he's not usually the guy who comes up with something first. He's not an inventor. But he is the guy that takes something that's already out there and he always has a plan to make it better. He was the guy that took a lot of what was already going on and he made it better. To the point now where his products are some of the most well-recognized products in the world. He is the man with a plan. But there's one thing that Steve Jobs did not plan for. There's one thing that he couldn't be prepared for. And that's at the age of 48 being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. No matter how successful he was in business, no matter how much he had achieved in improving all of these different products, in the end, Steve Jobs was as vulnerable and as limited as all of us. His plan couldn't save him. His plan couldn't prepare him for what tomorrow brought. And after he was diagnosed, the next few years of his life became completely complicated as he worked out how to try and tackle this, how to try and plan for this thing that he couldn't have foreseen. As ambitious as he was, in the end, there's nothing he could do. And that's a truth that makes us all very uncomfortable, that there is a part of life that is completely out of our control, no matter how successful we are in our plans. This is what James says at the start of today's passage. He says, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Let me ask you guys that this morning. What is your life? What are the goals that you are setting for yourself? What is the trajectory that you are placing yourself on? Where do you find your hope and your confidence in the future of your life? James here is addressing a certain crowd in the midst of his recipients. If you remember, James is a letter that isn't written to a specific church. Rather, James was writing a letter to these Christians who, because of persecution, had been scattered all around the Middle East and the Mediterranean. And he's trying to help them wrestle with, well, what does it mean now in our lives that Jesus has done what he's done? And he says this, and we can kind of assume by the way that he writes it in his letter that there was probably a crowd of people either saying verbatim what he writes, or there was a general idea amongst them that they uh, had these ambitious plans of how they were going to make their life work. They were going to go to such and such a place, they were going to do business, they were going to turn a profit, something that isn't all that unfamiliar to us. That's how we think about our lives most often. Well, if we, if we go to the right place at the right time and we put our work in and we put our effort in, then we're gonna get an, a, a result. We're gonna get exactly what we want. We kind of unspokenly have this winning formula for life, especially in our culture. That if, we, if we get the right degree, if we make the right connections, if we put ourselves in the best spot, then we are, it's inevitably, we're gonna thrive. We're gonna do well. And what James has to say about this is that, that that is a very arrogant way of thinking about life. Now, I, I want to make clear, James isn't criticizing the idea of planning. If you're a Christian, it's not bad to plan. That's not what his point is. James is actually going for something a little bit deeper. He's trying to dig beneath our plans and ask us, how do we plan? Why do we plan? What is it that we are pointing ourselves towards? What is it that we are placing our confidence in? Because usually when we plan, we are trying to create something that we can then fall back on, that we can rest in, that can give us confidence. 
We say, well, if we do this and we go to this place, then it'll be okay, it'll work out. And what James is saying is, if you plan like that, if that's how you design your future, then you're gonna be disappointed. He's not upset with them because they're making plans. In fact, quite the opposite, the Bible encourages us to make plans. He wants them to think about what they're saying. He's wanting them to pause and take stock and think, what is your life? What is it that you are doing with your plans? Why are you making them? One of my favorite pastors says, that human beings are a people who are stuck in the weeds. We cannot see the grand scheme for all of the blades of grass, but God can, and God does. The idea that James is trying to scratch at is, you are limited, you are finite. There is no way that any one human being can actually design a really good plan for their life because we don't know what is going to happen, even tomorrow. I would even go further, I think James is being quite generous. I would say we don't even know what's gonna happen this afternoon. All it would take is one message, one piece of news, to completely rearrange our plans, the wrong text, the wrong thing happening, and we have no power over it. King Solomon wrote a book called Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament. It's not one of the most well-read books of the Bible, but a very, very interesting one. Because the whole idea of Ecclesiastes is King Solomon, this very wise king of Israel, wants to figure out what life is really all about. And so he, he makes these different plans for how he is going to get the most out of life. He plans, well, I'm gonna leave a tremendous legacy. I'll build incredible buildings and temples and palaces. And he finds that no matter what he does, no matter how much he builds, he's not satisfied. So then he makes a plan, well, I can, uh, create business and trade in the country and I can make a really great economy. And again, he finds what he calls it to be vanity. He even gets involved in numerous relationships. He has hundreds of wives. And in the end, he continually hits against this barrier and finds that no matter how much he plans, no matter how much he anticipates, no matter how ambitious he is, there is something missing. And this is what he says in the book of Ecclesiastes, in chapter six, verse 12. He says, who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? He goes on to say that the rich man and the poor man are both gonna end up in the same grave. What he's saying there, what he's, he's scratching at is that in the end, we have no control over our lives. No matter what we do, no matter what we plan, no matter how much ambition and effort and drive and skill, we are limited. And all of that should be a part of how we plan. James has this really powerful analogy. He comes and he tells the readers of his letter that they are a mist says, your life is a mist that appears for a short time and then vanishes. This is what we look like from God's perspective. And I turn it on. It's there and it's gone. It appears for a little time. Every great, incredible thinker, every most influential people in human history, they're all a mist to God. Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King Jr., Albert Einstein, all of these people that we admire, that we think are incredible planners, people who have built and been successful in the eyes of God are a mist. The span of our lives is so short. The influence of our life ultimately is very small. And again, the important thing to, to understand here is this is not a discouragement from James. This is not James saying, well, make sure that you know how completely infinitesimal and unimportant you are. That's not what he's saying. I think James is, is telling them a mist. He's trying to get them to get a better perspective so that they can have something better, so that they can look forward to something that is better, a better plan for their lives. The second question that James leads us to 
is what is God's will? What is God's will? Now, when I think about God's will, uh, I think about a, a time in college when I was a Christian, and I was amongst a crowd of young college Christians. And if, if you were a Christian in college, you probably remember college Christians are weird people. We just do weird things. We get very zealous. If you meet Jesus for the first time in college, you get overexcited. And around the idea of God's will, I would often hear one of two things. Number one, I would hear guys who say, I think it's God's will to marry that girl. I need to tell her that God told me I need to marry her. Which really, if we think about it, is, is a way of saying she probably will say no, but if I say God, then she has to do it. Because God said that she has to do it. So that was the first way. The second way I had was the opposite of that. There would be people coming home broken hearted and they say, well, we were, we were on a date and she told me that it, it just wasn't God's will for her to be dating me. Which is another cop out because it's like, well, I would date you, but God said no, so... Right, and we usually think of God's will in these very specific, kind of whimsical ways. Who should we marry? What profession should we have? Where should we let our life take us? And we ask God as though God's will is some kind of secret that needs to be unlocked and understood so that we can finally be happy if we can only know what God's will is for our life. But the truth is, God's will, most of the time, isn't dealing with such specific things. James says that instead, when we plan, we ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. If the Lord wills. He almost goes back and reiterates, you know, what you are planning is fine, as long as you are planning that in light of what the Lord wills. So then what does the Lord will? God has really made a lot of his will very plain to us. We don't like to admit that or concede that, but most of God's will for our life, 99% of what God intends, plans, and desires for our life is very plain to us in Scripture. We've been reading a lot about it in James, the way we are to live, the way we are to treat other people, the way we are to think about our relationships and our professions. In 1 Thessalonians, a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote when he wrote to Thessalonica, he said in chapter 4, verse 3, this is the will of God for your life, your sanctification. Very objective statement there. If you want to know the will of God for your life, it's this, your sanctification. Sanctification is this very theological word for basically saying it's his will for your life that you would be changed from what you were into something that looks more like Jesus. Something that better reflects who God is in this world. That's his will for your life. Now that doesn't tell us who we are supposed to marry. That doesn't tell us what job we should get or where we should live. But this is 99% of what God's wills for our life. That we would be changed. That in everything, no matter what it is, good or bad, hard or easy, that we would look more like Jesus. He goes on to say in the next chapter, chapter five, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Rejoicing, praying, being thankful, that's the substance of what it means to be a Christian. That's what Paul is saying, that is what the Bible is saying God's will is, is that we would become a people that are more prone to rejoicing, being thankful, loving one another, serving one another, sacrificing one another. That is God's will for your life. I'm not saying that God doesn't care about the details. I'm not saying that those are not important. Those are incredible, important questions. But 99% of what God's will is for our lives is about being more like Jesus. Think of it this way. If we were driving a car and we're looking out of uh, the front windscreen, you've got the road in front of you. And the safest way to drive is to look at what is ahead of you, to look at what is the first thing that you need to be heading towards. Now, when you're driving, you know that what is in your peripheral, what is in the corners of your eye is also important. You need to be aware that it's there. But if you look at it, if you put your attention on it, the car starts to drift. 
right? I'm a terrible driver. If you've seen me, this is what happens because I'm too nosy. I'm driving down Main Street in Geneva and I see something and it's like this. And that's a terrible way to drive, right? If, if your attention, your focus, your primary concern is what is peripheral, what is on the outside, what is secondary, then you can't drive straight. And the worst case scenario, if that's, that's how you drive, is you're gonna end up crashing. And the same is true in life. If you make what is peripheral, this small fraction of God's will for your life, if you make that the main concern, instead of what is primary, then you will drift and you will end off the road. And if we keep that analogy going a little bit further, what's also true is, in most cases, if you make the main thing the main thing, if your attention is forward, then most often God will bring what is peripheral around as the road takes you forward. These other questions that are important become far more clear when your attention is, what, is on what is most important. So again, it's not that God doesn't care about these, it's not that they're not important questions, but God has a way of bringing those to light that is best for you. And that is to make the main thing the main thing. That is to make your primary concern in terms of God's will for your life being changed to be more like Jesus. On the kind of things that James talks about in his letter, the way that you speak, the way that you serve, how you use your job, how you use your finances, how you use your marriage and relationships. The thing that we're prone to do most often is to make a plan for our life of what we would like and then ask God to bless that. But God being God does not care for that form of planning because God wants to be the center of our plans. When Jesus was alive, he said in John 6, 38, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of my Father who sent me. What's incredibly miraculous about Jesus, what is shocking about Jesus, is that despite the fact that Jesus was in very nature God, the one whose will was perfect, as a model to us and a demonstration to us of what our lives should look like, he said, I am moving what I desire for my life to the side in favor of my Father who loves me. My job is to do his will, what he has called me to. Now that's a hard thing for us to do in our lives because there's a lot of dreams and hopes that we make for ourselves. But what James is telling us, what Jesus is telling us is that if you trust your heavenly Father, if you defer to him, then he is not limited like you. He is not finite like you. He knows about tomorrow. In another instance, Jesus told a crowd of people that were listening to him, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has its own problems. Rather, think about today. What Jesus is saying is your heavenly Father knows what you need. He is the one who is able to plan best for your life. So if you look to his will, if you look to what he has asked of you, then you will have a plan that cannot fail. No matter what tomorrow brings, love him, love others, live for eternity, store up treasures in heaven. If we plan around our own definitions of success and happiness, then tomorrow can steal those things away from us in a heartbeat. But if we make Jesus the plan, if we look to what he has asked of our lives and how we use our resources and how we use our time, then we will have a plan that is firm. We will build it upon a rock instead of on sand. So here's how you can start doing that. Here's how you can start thinking about how you are planning. Ask yourself a few questions like this. When you make your plans, are you spending more time thinking about the peripheral things than the main things? When you plan out what is ahead, are you thinking about details that are of secondary importance? Are you thinking about what is in front of you right now? There's a lot of people in the Bible uh, who pray to God about his will. But most often, if not entirely, when those people pray, they're not praying to know God's will, they're praying for the courage to do it, to live it out, because they know that he's made it quite plain. 
when we plan, start thinking about what James is challenging us to in this letter, what we've already talked about. Is that a part of your plan? Are you making it a, an intentional part of your plan to love your neighbors, to find time, to show grace to them, to get to know them, to serve them? That's really what the neighborhood vision is all about. That's really what a part of stadium service is all about, is letting our plans be for what is happening right now. This whole letter, James is pushing them to live out what they already know. And now he's pushing them to plan using what they already know. The last question that James raises or gets us to think about is what are you boasting in? He says at the close, as it is, you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him, it is sin. Classic way of James talking, very kind of blunt. But James is wrapping up his challenge by explaining to them, quite graciously in fact, the way that you are shaping your life, if you think that you're going to be able to do this, go to this place and have a winning result, is you are counting on your ability to do something instead of God's. It's arrogant because you're assuming that you can make this happen, that you have found the winning formula for your life. The flaw that these men and women were making is that they were assuming that they would have the time, they would have the good fortune, they would have the resources, and they would have the ability to carry out their plans. That as long as they have the plan that they're good. They were forgetting that this is who they were. They were forgetting that they don't know what's gonna happen in an hour's time. All it would take is one message, one little detail to change. How are you planning your life? What is the root of your confidence as you think about where God is carrying you? Is it in a certain plan? Is it in a 401k? Is it in a certain time where you plan to retire? Is it in reaching a certain position within your profession? What are you boasting in? When we talk about boasting, again, we're talking about what, where is your confidence, what gives you security, what gives you your hope? Is it in what you have planned for yourself? This is not meant to shame anyone. I'm as guilty of this as anybody else because I have a really hard time planning out my life in view of what God has, has asked me. I have hopes for myself. I have dreams for myself. And it's easier for me to plan those things and think about those things than it is about what God's asking me to do. Because sometimes what God asks me to do pushes back on those things. We are so prone to plan out our entire lives with this winning formula and forgetting about what God wants from us, what God has asked of us. And James is actually doing these people a kindness. He's showing them grace by bringing those, this up and saying, there is something better for you than your plans. Good question to ask is, what if you, your plan didn't work out? That reveals your confidence very quickly. What if something changed? What if tomorrow you couldn't have the plan that you have for yourself now and you had to change it around? If one thing was taken away, if your job was taken away, if a loved one was taken away, how would your plan change? Would you be okay with it? Would you, despite the difficulty, have a security, have something to rest in in God? Or would the loss of your plan cripple you? Do you see why this is grace from James? He's trying to prevent them from building their lives on something that is unpredictable. Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians 1.21, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. For Paul, whether he lives or dies, he has confidence because of Jesus. To live is Christ, to die is gain. One way or the other, I'm okay. And then he goes on to say in another letter, in Romans 14, 8, he says, if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. 
because of the God who gave himself for Paul, Paul is completely unafraid about what tomorrow brings. It's not because Paul is naive, it's not because Paul is stupid, it's because Paul knows God. He knows who he is. This past week, some of you know that Chapel Street suffered a tremendous loss. There's a member of our staff, a man called John Harper, who passed away very suddenly from a stroke. Very suddenly. Went home to be with Jesus. And John was in many ways the backbone of this church, and I say that because he helped us all stand so much taller. It was his job to make sure that we didn't destroy all three campuses. I should say it was his job to make sure I didn't destroy the campuses with middle school events, make sure that my slip and slides didn't tear up the grass too much. He made us all better at what we did. And this passage for many of us on staff this week couldn't be more real. As we read about not being promised tomorrow, remembering that we don't know what's coming because someone we loved very dearly isn't here anymore and he was taken from us in a heartbeat. But as I've thought about this passage and I've thought about what James is calling us to and challenging us to, and I think about John Harper, I probably couldn't come up with a better example of of the type of man or woman that God wants us to be than someone like him because he lived out his faith. Street-level faith was John Harper. He lived for Christ and he desired Christ's will for his life. John was a big part of the upcoming stadium service. He was a huge part of making sure that that goes off well, planning the details of it. And he would meet with members of staff at Cougar Stadium, making sure that everything was set. And we were told very shortly after John Harper's death that uh, one of the members that he had, had met with, one of the people on staff there, and a member of our church, had sat down to talk about these details, and the meeting was really not about spiritual things, let's say, it was about making sure that the details were set. But John made it a priority to pray. And this person shared with us that when they heard John pray, when they heard him talk about it, when they heard John pray that at the stadium service, people would come to know the love and the mercy of Jesus Christ, they were blown away by the faith of this man, that his priority was not on these things that are secondary, it was on Jesus. That is the story that you will hear about him from everyone who knew him. He was working tirelessly, he was planning to make that service about Jesus. When I think about authentic Christian living, and I think about this call throughout the entire letter of James to let our lives be a demonstration of what we believe. To be a people who are not hearers only, but doers. To be the kind of people who think about how we speak today, about how we serve today. I think about John Harper. John Harper was a man who built his plans on the foundation of Jesus. And when you build your plans on Jesus, they cannot fail. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, thank you that you have provided yourself for our sake, that not only can we be forgiven and redeemed in you, but Lord, our lives can be lived through you, built on you. Lord, as we are challenged by this passage this morning, would you remind us that we're not promised tomorrow, that we are missed, that appears for a short time and then vanishes. Would you remind us that there is a better way to plan our lives, and that is to look to you, to the the things that you have asked of us, the promises that you have made us for today. Lord, we love you, and we want to build our lives, not on our will, but on yours. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.